Okay, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Just a few minutes till it's official class time. Got about four and a half minutes to go. But thanks for being here so far. I'm just going to grab myself a drink, shut a window. I'll be right back. Sparkling water. Gotta stay hydrated. Hi Chelsea, good to see you. Welcome back. Hey Margarito. Hello, hello. Hey John, Noah. Hope you guys had a good weekend. <clears throat> Hi, Danny. Hello, Dylan. How's it going? Danny, hey, hey there. Brenda, Emily, hello. Good morning, afternoon. I guess it's all the same. Hi, Diego. <clears throat> Edward, Sophia, hello. Hi, Jay. Just a couple minutes to go. So it's finally March. What do you think? Did, it, did the first two months seem like an eternity or did they just fly by? I, hear, I always hear people say the both opposite things. Like, oh, this is like the, th the third year of 2021 versus people saying, where did the first two months go? Hi, Nick. <clears throat> Hi, Abani. Fly by, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm kind of of two minds. Once it's over, you're like, wow, that was fast. But then when you're in the middle of like a bunch of work, teaching, studying, it seems like every day, you know, even just one class period could just take forever. But yeah, it's nice to be in March. This is my birthday month. It's also the spring kind of starting finally. So I like the turn of the weather, a little bit of extra sun. Soon we'll have the daylight saving spring forward. That'll be nice. Any other March birthdays here? I wonder, just curiosity. Maybe someone will let me know. Hey everybody, good to see everyone arriving to the meeting. Mick, Vanessa, Megan, Ray, Blake. Oh, you're on the 27th? Okay, nice, Jay. Yeah, I'm on the 17th. That's St. Patrick's Day coming up two weeks. <clears throat> hi, hi, hello. Good to see everyone here. <clears throat> Okay. Well, great, everybody. Thanks again for being here. It's pretty much now uh, 1 p.m., so I'm just going to get the class started. Um, welcome back. Hope you had a good weekend. To everybody here, feel free at any point to just uh, leave a comment behind in our chat, and that's just a quick way of getting your attendance noted for the meeting. Um, all right, so let me make mention of this. 
I've been, I was grading a lot over the weekend on the last of the quiz that y'all did, and I finished with the work of grading it. So I sent a message to Titanium last night when I finished up the grading just to let you guys know that the grades are done and I'm ready to report them to any individual student who wants to request their grade by email. So I'm inviting you to please send me an email so that you can get your grade for the first quiz or your first homework or both, depending on whether you already asked me before for the homework uh, grade. My policy in the class, and I think I've mentioned it before, is just that when it's time for you to receive grades, I like to do them individually per student request. So you do have to send me an email, and then I'll be happy to reply back to you with your grade, comments, and any other uh, information that's helpful to you. I just ask that you give me a window of as, most, uh, at, at mu as much as 48 hours to reply. Um, so I sent the message off last night. Anybody who's sending me a message that wants their grade, just know I'll get back to you within two days window at the most. I have just a lot of emails and other things uh, coming in to me, so that's why I just want to give myself a little bit of a range of time. But feel free to send me that message whenever you're ready, and if you like, I'll tell you your grade for the first quiz or homework or both. And uh, that's pretty much that. So we're done with the first two things in the semester. Now we're looking forward to the midterm. That's next Thursday. Uh, sorry, not Thursday. This is Monday, Wednesday class. It's next Wednesday. And um, <clears throat> today the class meeting and next class is about chapter four. So we're going to have two class meetings on chapter four. And then next week we'll review on Monday for the midterm. I'll send you guys the study guide for our review session over the weekend. And then we will, you know, uh, have a midterm examination that I'll distribute to you guys next Wednesday. So that's the upcoming couple of meetings with just a couple of um, quick notes about the the last assignment that's done and other other such matters. So anyway, guys, if there's no questions about any of those things, um, then I guess I'll just jump right back into our lecture material. As usual, if you ever do have questions, comments, reactions, anything, go ahead and put it in the chat and we'll just take them as they come. Okay, so good to see everybody and welcome back. All right, so there's just a, one or two leftover items of vocabulary from chapter three. When we were closing the meeting last time, we were talking about rhetorical devices. The chapter three last week was all about language and communication, and we got through almost everything, but there were just a few leftover rhetorical devices at the tail end that I didn't get to talk about. So I wanna to open today by just closing that and uh, finishing that off, and then we'll segue into chapter four as soon as we're ready. So um, just a couple of last things from previous week lecture. Um, and from the book, assigned readings from last week. We were talking at the close about rhetorical devices. Okay, so rhetorical devices are ways that we can use language or ways that language can be used to manipulate a person's point of view or to shape their um, opinion without giving a rational argument. So one rhetorical device mentioned last week was the euphemism. Um, does anybody remember the basic definition of that? What does what the word euphemism mean? What is a euphemism? Let's see, and then that will bring us back into our notes as we slowly get our bearings for today. So what's a euphemism, anyone? Hmm. It's one of the rhetorical devices. Okay, so good then, Margarito. It's the replacement of a negative term with a positive one. Right, well, it, yeah, replacing a negative or a neutral word with a more positive sounding one, why would somebody do that? Well, in order to sugarcoat the truth or to make something appear better than it might otherwise appear simply by the use of language. Good, that's all correct, guys. So like, for example, someone has died and uh, maybe they would be rather described as uh, having passed away or in a better place. Um, let's see. A house is small, and you're trying to sell it. So you describe it not as small, per se, but as cozy, quaint. Car is old, and you want to sell this car, so you're going to call it retro or vintage. Um, just examples here of euphemistic labels for things that make something appear maybe better than it otherwise might have, if not for the use of euphemism. Um, I'm looking in the book here, and they give a couple of other interesting examples. Suppose someone's really loud. You know, they're just loud and always talking out of turn, raising their voice. So the euphemism maybe is this person is outgoing. They're just extroverted. That sounds really nice. Saying they're loud, it sounds like a criticism. Saying that they're outgoing sounds like a nice compliment. So it's the same kind of idea, but being described with a euphemistic label. Um, someone has no manners. They lack basic social skills. 
So a euphemism could be saying, oh, they're uninhibited. This is just a free spirit, you know? They're an uninhibited person. They, they let you know what they think and feel. But that sounds much better, doesn't it, than saying impolite, poor, poor manners. Um, let's see. Um, da, 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 da. So somebody that's like really obsessive, you could just say is um, very uh, attached, you know, instead like they, they're, they form strong attachments instead of saying that they're like almost stalking people. So anyway, you know, euphemisms make something sound better. Sometimes they take away the place where a criticism might have reasonably been made. Um, so we have to see through sometimes euphemisms that we encounter in everyday speech, media, political speech, and so on. Now, on the other hand, there's dysphemism, guys. And since we have already sp spoken about what is a euphemism, I think you'll remember dysphemism pretty easily. A dysphemism is the opposite of a euphemism. So it's to try and replace a more positive sounding word or a neutral sounding word with something that sounds more negative uh, in order to create disapproval towards that thing. So what could have been innocently described as the estate tax or the inheritance tax gets labeled as the debt tax. Um, what could have been described as a person's pro-choice position on abortion gets labeled as anti-life. Um, a person who um, is smoking cigarettes is described as using cancer sticks. Um, I'm not sure how many others I'd like to mention, but as I look at the book, um, you know, so somebody who's devoutly religious could be described as a fanatic. Um, and, you know, so those are all re reasonable and fair examples. You sometimes see dysphemisms in the same places where you see euphemism. And again, it's an attempt to perhaps illegitimately shape your view through the use of language without giving a rational argument to the same conclusion. Okay, so now we can go on for a little longer on this topic of rhetorical devices. I didn't get to speak about sarcasm, although I think I wrote it on the board. So the sarcastic comment or the sarcastic remark, another use of r rhetoric. Um, and what sarcasm is, is, is that familiar use of um, irony, ridicule, um, or taunting to deflect critical analysis or make fun of the subject of sarcasm. So, Okay, so it says sarcasm, the use of ridicule, irony, or insult to deflect critical analysis or make light of something. And um, I think sarcasm is a popular mode of speech for especially a lot of younger people, but also just people of all ages, really. Um, we've all used sarcasm, and we've all um, heard sarcasm used by others. The typical framework of a sarcastic comment is like a person who says something, but through their tone of voice or through the context, it is clear to everybody that they don't literally mean what they have said, and in many cases, they intend to convey the exact opposite of what the literal uh, words mean in their statement. So like, you know, somebody drops, they, they turn around and they knock over an expensive um, heirloom at a friend's house. So they basically break a vase or something that's been inherited over 150 years of family history. And, um, Someone who's standing there with them sees them break it, and you know the first reaction maybe, uh, if it's going to be a sarcastic comment, be like, "Wow, awesome, good job, like, smooth move, buddy." Like, obviously, when you say something like that, you're being sarcastic. You don't really mean they did anything awesome or smooth. You mean to, to the quite contrary that they were awkward and clumsy and broke something. And now to make fun of them a little bit, insult them, to sort of twist the knife a bit, you say something a, a sarcastic compliment at that time. Right, like um, someone does something really poorly judged and unwise and you say, oh, genius, that's really smart. Um, 
Can you guys think of any other easy examples of, of the case of using sarcasm? It happens all the day. Sometimes it's in writing, if it's like online or through messages. And many times it's through that characteristic tone of voice. You can hear the sarcasm dripping from a person's voice when they don't mean what they say literally. Um, so I don't know, any, any quick examples or suggestions in the chat of what could be an example like that? Hmm. Like someone's not having fun doing something, and they're like, wow, this is like, this is a thrill. Yeah, this is an amazing time while they're just sitting at the DMV. You know, like they're saying it sarcastically, not to be taken seriously, but you kind of convey the point through the sarcastic mode of speech or writing. Anything else? So Jay, someone uh, brags. Oh yeah, so someone brags and tries to make themselves look interesting or better, and their correspondent says, oh wow, yeah, that's really cool but like in a sarcastic tone of voice, so you can tell that they're just kind of belittling whatever they have said. Um, teenage siblings, and you hear it every day, Brenda. Um, okay, mom, like, yeah, as if you were the person's mother. So this is a sarcastic way of framing the situation such that you're being too authoritative or, um, you know, offering too much guidance to people who are not wanting it. And so they refer to you sarcastically as the mother figure. Good, so sarcasm, I'll say this about sarcasm, it has its place, I think it's definitely, you know, funny sometimes with humor or when you're around friends and everyone's kind of on the same page. But there is also a kind of dark side to sarcasm, right? Sometimes um, people want to be able to rely on the accuracy of what you're saying and they want you to be serious and direct. So if you fall back on sarcasm too often, then after a while, people start to not necessarily take you seriously. And... I also noticed that sometimes when people are sarcastic, they stop to take themselves, they stop taking themselves as seriously too. Think about how many times somebody says something like on, on online, social media or something, and someone calls them out for it saying, how could you really write that? Or how could you really post that? And then they come back and say, oh, come on, you know, it's just sarcasm. You know, you know, I didn't really mean that. I'm just trying to be funny. But after a while, the line gets blurred, doesn't it? Between when you're really speaking to your mind and when you are being sarcastic. And after a while, that line becomes so blurry that you become an unserious type of person who even you can't necessarily um, take your own words and thoughts with a dose of serious credibility. Um, so don't just be giving in to sarcasm all the time. There's a time for it, but there's also a good time to be serious and rational and level-headed. Um, if we speak sarcastically all the time, then after a while, our statements start to lose their credibility and believability, and we're just taken as a sort of joker. Um, Diego, when my friends tell me that I'm looking fresh, well, maybe sometimes I would hope they're meaning it's, you know, literally, uh, but yeah, if you're coming, you know, wearing just whatever silly outfit that's just, uh, thrown together, maybe they're just trying to be sarcastic about it. So yeah, um, I sometimes notice that people, they say offensive things, like people will say offensive things, racist, sexist, you know, ableist or whatever, something on Twitter. And then when they're called out, they're like, come on, you can't take a joke. This is just sarcasm. Well, after a while, though, people don't want everything to be a joke, and sometimes you do have to be honest and sincere. So sarcasm is a habit that we can form, but if we do it all the time, then we become less than fully serious people, even in those cases where it's important to be taken seriously. Okay, so anyways, sarcasm. Now, there's just a few more of these rhetorical devices. I want to mention the hyperbole. Hyperbole. Um, and what that is... You maybe have heard this word. It's just using exaggeration or overstatement to distort the truth, to go beyond the facts. So the use of exaggeration or overstatement uh, to distort the truth. Hyperbole. Um, exaggerating, making things seem bigger, better, more impressive than they really are through the use of language. So like sometimes it's just happening in everyday little situations. Someone um, was attending a lecture, they thought it was boring, and they're like, man, that lecture was so boring, I was dying. I was literally dying while I was watching it. No, not literally the person wasn't dying. That's a bit of an overstated exaggeration, but I guess it emphasizes the heights of boredom that the person felt they were experiencing at that moment. Um, or somebody, you know, they didn't quite like a meal and they say, oh my God, this is the worst thing I've ever eaten. This is like literally trash. 
So again, it's, it's a hyperbolic statement. It's going beyond the facts. Sometimes it's innocent enough when people understand the context and they can tell that you're just exaggerating. But again, hyperbole is really on the borderline of deception and lying. I mean, um, what if you exaggerate facts about yourself to make yourself seem better when you're early in a dating relationship or in a job application scenario or um, just when you're making friends? If you exaggerate or give hyperbolic statements about your track record, your history, your experience, etc., then this can be dishonest. And eventually, if it's discovered, the person won't appreciate that you were exaggerating when they wanted to know just basic information and facts. Um, so hyperbole, kind of like sarcasm, can become a bad habit. If you exaggerate and you become a serial exaggerator all the time, then after a while, people notice this about you and they stop taking you seriously even when eventually it matters a lot and you want people to take you seriously. Um, there's an old story called The Boy Who Cried Wolf. Probably some of you remember this story from your childhood. If not, the basic detail is that there was a boy. He would always cry out that there was a wolf and he was just exaggerating the dangers. But eventually there was a wolf. And because he had been given to hyperbole, hyperbole for so long, nobody actually believed him when the, when the case was real and when he actually needed help. So you want people to know when you're being serious, honest, and when you're going beyond the truth. If you're too hyperbolic all the time, then you kind of undermine and erode your own credibility down the line longer term. Um, okay. And finally, we can close this last part of chapter three notes with a reference to just deception. And um, there are basically two types of deception, okay? So one, there's active deception, and then the other is passive deception. With active deception, what's going on is a person is actually saying false stuff. So this is like lying. When you deliberately say things that are false in order to mislead people, this is active deception. So <clears throat> okay, so active deception, deliberately stating a falsehood in order to mislead. We say deliberately because if it was unintentional, that, that would just be misinformation rather than deception. Like if you heard wrong information and passed it on to someone else, but you thought it was true, you wouldn't be trying to deceive them in that case, but you would be misinforming them. With deception, though, active deception, you're trying to get this person to have the wrong idea. So it would be like someone says to you, um, like you're trying to conceal the whereabouts of someone and they and they and someone asks you, do you know where that person is? You'd be like, no, I have not, I have no idea in the world. Meanwhile, they're like hiding in your closet somewhere in the house. Um, at that point in time, you're, you're misinforming this person deliberately in order to mislead them from the truth of where the person is. Or somebody asks you, you know, have you cheated on me? You're in a relationship with them and let's say you did cheat and you're just saying, no way, no, never. I would never do that, so I'm telling the truth, but you're lying. So in that case, again, you're saying something false, which you know is false, and you're doing it so that they don't come to know the truth. So that's deception. That's lying. That can happen in a personal situation. That can happen in a professional situation or academically or um, in any different avenue of human life, which we want to avoid, right? People rely on the truth in our statements so that they know what is true and false. Um, we don't want to become the kind of people who are liars, deceivers, manipulators, uh, not just because it's wrong morally, but it also invites liability on us and blowback down the line when inevitably, you know, our deceptive ways get uncovered. And then there's passive deception, which is just this difference. With passive deception, it's not saying something false, but it's not saying what is true. So this is withholding the truth. It's sometimes they call that a lie of omission. Um, withholding the truth. So active deception in the case of cheating would be like someone says, are you seeing, did you, have you been seeing somebody else? And they say no, when in fact they have. Passive deception would be like you're never prompted to answer the question because it never comes up, but you also just don't reveal it to the other person. So, um, you know, instead of saying I did not cheat on you earlier today, it's just like, hey, pass the salt, what's for dinner? And you just don't bring it up. And in that case, you're, you're still concealing the truth and the, the facts from somebody, 
but not through the presentation of a false statement instead of withholding on the truth. Same could be seen in the job interview scenario. A person could lie about their job prior history. They could say they have experience that they don't have, but they could also omit facts about their work history, like not saying that they got fired somewhere or not telling you about one of their references and how to contact them. So sometimes we are deceptive by concealing the truth. And in other cases, we present an entire false set of facts or information to other people. And so good people, truthful people, critical thinkers, we pursue the truth. We try to find out what's true. So to the extent that we have others that deceive or that we sometimes deceive, that's getting in the way of the goal of truth. So we should not do this unless, you know, there's like some kind of greater, higher purpose. Obviously, once in a while, a little bit of deception is a hurt of person, I guess, and could be innocent enough. If somebody asks you, how am I looking today? And you're like, man, their outfit is really not looking good. You just want to make them feel better. So you might say, oh, you're looking great. And in that case, it's deceptive, I guess, because it's not a revealing statement about what you really think. But nonetheless, it's done with good intent. So I don't know. Maybe there's room sometimes for deception of limited kinds. But we don't want to fall into those bad habits because of all the things that I mentioned. Okay, so that finishes the notes of Chapter 3, guys. And I just want to make sure we didn't skip over those last few points. But now we move ahead and we talk about Chapter 4 in the book. Okay? So Chapter 4. What is Chapter 4 all about? Um, it's all about knowledge and the limits of human knowledge. So knowledge and its limits. So knowledge is the big topic for this week, and we're going to try and look at that in all depth. So um, <clears throat> this is some topic that this is a topic that I'm quite interested in. I mean, I like all topics in philosophy, but discussions of knowledge and human knowledge are really important to me because I guess that was my special focus as a grad student when I was getting my PhD in philosophy. You know, I worked on the theory of knowledge, epistemology, which is a major branch of philosophy. So I'm, I'm a major fan of this type of topic in philosophy, just, just as a sort of side note. Um, so we're going to ask these kind of questions, like what is knowledge? What are the component parts of knowledge? How do we get it? And what are the things that prevent us sometimes from getting the knowledge that we want? Um, so many of the chapters of our textbook open up with like a reference to some real world incident to kind of give you a little more, um, to bring you into the topic a little bit more, to deepen the interest and to make it a little more relatable. So like in chapter three, they started talking about language and communication with mention of the Benghazi scandal and how poor communication there might've facilitated a loss of life. In uh, <clears throat> chapter one, the topic of uh, the famous social psychology experiments was brought up at the beginning to give the reader the sense of how important and valuable um, critical thinking is on an everyday human level. Well, in chapter four, there's also a little reference to some actual interesting real world cases at the beginning that give a sense of the importance of knowledge and what can go wrong when we process information incorrectly. So let me give you some of those um, little anecdotes. First of all, they are talking to us about cases of medical error, some famous cases of medical error, medical mistakes that can and, and have happened. One of them is from 1995. So at a university hospital in Florida, a man named William King, 52 years old, was supposed to get a surgical procedure to have his leg amputated. And the reason was because the leg had become infected and gangrenous. And so the best way to preserve his life and um, the health of his bloodstream, et cetera, would be to, to sever that leg and to live as an amputee. So the surgery was all set up and scheduled to get this leg taken off. But the problem, once he was under full anesthetic and the surgical team was doing their work, they somehow got their files mixed up and they actually amputated the wrong leg, okay? So the healthy leg is the one that they removed. Of course, this is a grievous case of medical error because that means that now he would have to become a double amputee since the other leg was all obviously still in need of amputation. Um, other cases mentioned in the same part of chapter four, Dennis Quaid, so this is a former Hollywood actor. Um, he had newborn twins and they had a blood disease. So the doctors were going to prescribe them a blood thinning medication, but they accidentally gave them a dosage a thousand times beyond the prescription, which almost led to their deaths. Um, 
so these are just a few cases, tip of the iceberg, but how do they happen? Well, you might be thinking, oh, because we had some really incompetent and just um, basically dumb doctors and medics working these facilities that made terrible errors that no one would normally make. That's not actually the right takeaway. These are highly trained professionals, very skilled in their field. And so it just reminds us that even people like that, that are highly trained and professional and where things of great importance are on the line, still these kind of mistakes can be made. In fact, um, these kind of human error that lead to medical errors is the number one leading cause of medical mistakes. You know, So after such incidents happen, all kinds of protocols are developed to try and prevent it from ever happening again, like a more structured double backup safety officer system, um, computer monitors and extra precautions all being put in place to try and make sure this can't happen again. But again, the reminder is that even highly trained professionals can experience mental and cognitive error that leads to such mistakes. So if that can happen with even the best and highly trained of, among us, it can certainly happen with any of us in our more limited everyday circumstances. So we're going to try our best then to determine what are the sources, the common sources of error that we make when we process information so that we can do better and hope to avoid making such mental mistakes. Um, and we're going to just try and learn what knowledge is, um, what are some different theories about where most of it comes from, how to evaluate evidence, what are some unreliable sources of evidence, and uh, yeah, and then we will talk about the cognitive and perceptual errors that people make. Okay, so that's the scope of chapter four and some just initial setup. From here, let's jump into some vocabulary. So first of all, knowledge and the definition of knowledge itself. You might be surprised to know that there is a consensus definition of knowledge that is quite ancient and that we've inherited from ancient Greeks that, and this same definition pretty much persists through to the current day. Knowledge is believed to have three major components or parts. It's basically considered to be a justified true belief. So the right way of defining that is this. It's information that we believe, which is true, and for which we have justification. So the three major parts, truth, belief, and justification. <clears throat> Epistemologists, as we sometimes call ourselves, those that specialize on the theory of knowledge and philosophy, um, we're fond of an acronym that sums this up a little bit more briefly. And the acronym is that K, the letter that stands for knowledge, is equal to, kind of like a formula, K is equal to JTB where these three letters each stand for one of the three uh, pillars of knowledge and the definition of it. J for justification. Okay, well, I'm not going to be able to write the whole thing unless I write it very small. Let me try it again. Okay, almost. <laughs> justification, truth, and belief. Justified true belief. That's what knowledge is. And we've actually talked about two of these terms earlier in the semester, so I want to kind of bring that back to your mind for a moment. Let's ask again, what does this word truth mean? In order for a sentence to be true, this means what about it? Let me know one more time. What's the word truth all about? So I'm telling you I'm, uh, I'm wearing a watch. Is that true? just as a way of stimulating the definition to your mind again. Okay, yeah, so when the statement matches with the facts of reality, that's right, Danny. So right now it is true that I'm wearing a watch, as you can just see. But if I told you that I was wearing a sweater, um, I'm not. I'm wearing a T-shirt there's no sweater on. So that would be a false statement. So for number one, for you to have knowledge, the thing that you believe has to be actually correct and true. Um, what's a belief again? So we said what's... Truth, it's when the statement matches reality. What's belief? 
that's in the same section of our early notes that truth was in. So let me know about the belief point. What is that word? <clears throat> So we've heard truth is when a statement matches the facts of reality. Um, okay, now Brenda, when a person thinks that they sentence is true, and that's good. Yes, Brenda, correct. So those two things have to be there. You have to think something's true, and it has to actually be true. So you have to have a correct belief. Um, <clears throat> but one more part, justification. I guess we haven't quite talked about justification yet, but... Um, I think it's a word that maybe is already somewhere in your vocabulary. If not, let's let's bring it into focus. Um, justification. Well, we've got this part covered, so I'm going to just create a note about it. So what do you think it means to have justification? For a person to have a belief which is justified as opposed to contrasted with a belief that does not have any justification, which is unjustified. What do you think the status of being a justified belief means? Right? What does it mean when it's, when it is justified, not unjustified? So who thinks they know the difference between a justified or an unjustified belief? What gives it that status of being justified? If what? Any guesses are welcome. <clears throat> That's good, Blake. Yes, thank you. So backed up with evidence. Good. A justified belief, justification, is just having good evidence or good reasons to support your belief. Okay, so I'll put that here. Having good reasons or evidence to, do to support your belief. So the knowledge definition says that these three things have to all be in place for you to have knowledge. First of all, you have to think something's true. That's, that's fundamental. If you don't think it's true, then you, of course, couldn't possibly know it even if it is true. You kind of disqualify yourself from knowing something if you don't even believe it. right? So suppose, take the case that the Earth is a sphere. It's round. The shape of this planet is, is, is round. It's a spheroid shape. If there's a person who doesn't believe that, who thinks it's flat, then that flat earther, certainly that individual does not know that it's a sphere. Why doesn't that person know that it's a sphere? Because they don't even think that it is. So certainly we cannot say they know it's a sphere when they, don't, when they disagree with that claim. Second thing is that the belief has to be true. So you cannot know anything which is false. You can't know anything which is not a fact. So like, um, let me work with this example, I guess. Do you think that some person could... Uh, could know that I, Dr. Vulich, am nine feet tall. Is that a possible situation? Is it possible for anybody in this world to know that I am nine feet tall? Let me know what you think is the answer to that and then be prepared to tell me why or why not. Can that be something that is known? Is that a possible subject for knowledge? Can a person know that I, sitting here before you speaking to you, am nine feet in height? Can that be known about me? Don't overthink it because it's not, I don't think, the most difficult question. Can somebody know that I am uh, a nine-footer? Let me, let me ask you that and see what you think. It's just a yes or no question. The question, yes or no, can somebody know this? Well, Jay... Uh, saying if they measured me, because why? You think I'm nine feet tall? Come on, Jay, come on. No, come on. Nine feet, are you listening to the number? Do you know how tall nine feet is? And we're not talking about six foot, five foot, five foot nine, whatever. There's never been a human being ever that's nine feet tall. Well, there was Robert Wadlow, who was eight foot 11, and that's the all-time world record holder for height. But it's not possible. I'll just tell you straight up. No, nobody can know that I'm nine feet tall. Clearly, they cannot know that. And why not? Tell me, though, because we're not done. Why is that impossible? To, to know that Dr. Village is nine feet tall is not possible. And it's not possible to know that for the very simple reason that what? Hmm. 
Now you gotta tell me why that cannot be known. Because I'm saying it can't be known. It's not possible to know that. And there's a reason which you should be able to tell me. Okay, Margarito, because it hasn't been proven. Come on, no, 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 no. It's not about proof. There's just an objective fact. Um, let's try again. You're getting closer, Margarito, with your way of putting it. But when you said proof, that threw it all off because we're not talking yet at all about justification. Um, would it be because there has never been anyone that tall? Well, sure, I guess that's one way of putting it, Brenda, but more simply stated, in reference to me, Avani, this is also not true. It's possible for someone to be nine foot tall. There has been an eight foot 11 person. I guess if they had grown by just another few centimeters, then perhaps they would have touched nine feet. It's not that it's impossible. It's just because it's much more straightforward and basic than that. You cannot know that I am nine feet tall, just like you cannot know that the earth is flat. And in both cases, why not? Why is that not eligible to be knowledge? You're dancing around it, guys, but you just haven't said the simple fact. I mean, you can't know something like that because in this case, it's what? Well, I am using nine feet as an example, but I mean, say it clearly because it is not true. Exactly, Brenda. It's not true. It is not true that I'm nine feet tall. So nobody can know that because knowledge means you're getting it right, that you have the correct belief, that it's a true belief. So nobody can know this about me because it's false. Just like nobody can know that I'm 100 years old, right? Because it's just not, the tr it's not true. It's not the case. So nobody can know something which is incorrect. But I guess if a person was tripping on acid or drugs or mushrooms or something, then if that person's hallucinating and they think that they can see that I'm nine feet tall, they wouldn't know that I am nine feet tall because I'm not. But a person could, I guess, under certain very weird circumstances, could, could what? Concerning me being nine feet tall. They could never know this because it's not objectively true. But a person could subjectively what? Follow my thought there. No one can know it because it's false. But I guess a person, if they really, really were way off, they could believe that. They could think it's true, right? Like maybe a person can think that this planet is flat, but no one can know that because that is not true. Okay, so truth is a requirement for knowledge. Otherwise, when people have false beliefs, we would credit them for knowing that as well, which is, of course, totally ridiculous. Let me give you another quick example. Um, so sometimes you guys take multiple choice exams and stuff in some of your other classes, I guess. And... Um, Suppose that on one such quiz or test, it says, the Declaration of Independence of the United States, please, please circle the year where that was signed. And they give you four options, okay? So A says 1776, B says 1876, C says 1976, and D says the year 2024, okay? Now imagine you're that student and here's the question on the table and it says, select the option between A and D, which is the correct answer. Show us that you know the correct answer, okay? And you heard the question, right? When was Declaration of Independence of the United States signed? And you got those four options. 1776, 1876, 1976, 2024. Okay, now, suppose that some student, you know, they clearly eliminated 2024 because they figure that's the future, so Future hasn't happened yet. And then they're looking at the other three options and they just don't know. They're like, I can't remember, right? It's something about 76, but which century is it? I have no idea. So I'm just going to have to fill one of these bubbles in. I'm going to go with B, 1876. Okay, now tell me, guys, easy one. Did that student know the right answer? Did they know the answer to the question, when was this declaration signed? When they, when they filled in 1876, is that knowledge? Will they be credited with having knowledge of the right answer? Certainly no, they won't. That's the wrong answer. So hopefully this will give you another way of looking at it. You cannot be given credit for knowledge when your belief is false. So if this person thinks the declaration was signed in 1876, they don't know that because that's not what actually happened in history. So you can only know the things which are correct and true. If you have false beliefs, you know, they're ineligible to be knowledge. And Danny, you're, make, you're making another point, which is guessing. In this case, though, the problem is twofold, though. It's not just that they guessed and they didn't really have evidence. It's also that whatever they guessed was wrong. It was a wrong guess. Um, but now I want to take you to another example, all right? So suppose that, like the scenario I, get, I just gave, we have a student 
they have those four options. The question is, when was the Declaration of Independence of the United States signed? So they see 1776, 1876, 1976, they eliminate question D. Suppose they've narrowed it down, they're like, well, 1976 is a little too recent, so I figure it's got to be one of the other two answers, but I'm so bad with history and dates, I can't tell you. Is it 1776 or is it 1876? They're like thinking, thinking, they can't figure it out. In the end, they're like, I don't know, I'm just going to have to guess, wild guess here. I'm 17, so I like that number, so let me just write in A, 1776. Now, in that case, did the student get the right answer? Yes, okay. But did that student know the answer? I'm asking you a new question. The student who guesses 1776, and now, Danny, this kind of speaks to your point, but to the student who just guessed it randomly, did they know the answer? Again, the answer is no, they didn't have knowledge. In that case, what was missing? Well, two of the criteria were there. They had a belief, at least in the moment when they filled it out, and it was accurate, but what they were missing was justification. They didn't have reasons or evidence that they could give as to why this belief was true. So all three of those parts have to all be present for anybody to have knowledge. You have to think something is true, so you believe it. Then it actually has to be the right answer, so it has to be true to get it correct. That's the second thing. And then third, even if you have a true belief, if you're just randomly guessing it, that's also not knowledge. There has to be justification behind it, right? So, like, take this for example. I think maybe right now on the planet Earth, there's a certain number of human beings alive. Suppose that it's an even number. Could it be an even number? It could be because... The, the number is either odd or even at any given moment of time because every whole number is either divisible by two or it isn't. So the number of people that, let's say, were alive today, you know, at 1.42 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on the planet Earth. Suppose I just love even numbers, and so my choice is I'm going to believe that there's an even number of people that are alive right now. I could be correct, but I can't claim to know it. And the reason I can't claim to know it is that even if it is correct, I don't have any evidence that can prove it. So... For you to know things, you can't just have lucky guesses. You also have to have facts and evidence that you could give as the reason why this is true or believed to be true. So the person with a lucky guess gets credit for knowledge, but they didn't really have knowledge. The person who fills in the answer because they know exactly the history and the timeline and they can tell you all those facts, this is the one who actually knows the answer, even though both will be credited. Okay, so anyway, knowledge requires all three of those things, truth, belief, and justification. JTB. Um, last word will be this. <clears throat> Sometimes you can think about a metaphor of like building a cake out of the ingredients. So suppose that for every cake you needed to have water, flour, and sugar. Suppose those are all necessary ingredients. Um, well, each one is necessary to make the cake, but by itself, without the other two, it's not enough. So like if you just have water, you have something you need for this cake, but water without eggs and flour is just a pile of water and it's not a cake. Um, same with the flour and eggs. They need to be supplemented by the other uh, ingredients in order to come together and form the cake. So with knowledge, it's a bit of an imprecise analogy, but try to work with it. Think of these as the three ingredients that bake the so-called cake of knowledge. You have to have truth, belief, and justification. Two out of three is not enough, and one by itself is also not enough. Each thing is necessary, but without being complemented by the others, it still fails to be a case of knowledge. Okay, so if you have a true belief and you have no reason for thinking so, that's not knowledge. If you have a belief which you do have evidence for, but it's false, that is also not knowledge. Uh, suppose that a juror has to decide whether the defendant that they are uh, you know, sitting on a jury for is guilty or innocent. Um, if they make up their mind before hearing any of the evidence presented in court, then even if they're correct, like they see this guy walk in and they're like, I'm just going to vote guilty and I'm just going to like listen to my AirPods the whole time and ignore the evidence and wait till I get a chance to say vote guilty. That person might even have a correct belief, but it's not based on anything. So they don't really know the person's guilty. Um, on the other hand, suppose that there was very skilled lawyering going on and the prosecution made a pretty effective case that this person is guilty. You know, they, they show all kinds of evidence exhibits and give you all these reasons to believe they're guilty. But suppose that, in fact, the person was framed. So the juror believes with good reason that this person was guilty, but they don't actually know it because it's false. So you can't know that the person's guilty if they actually aren't. What you could have, I guess, in some cases, is a justified belief based on misleading evidence. So sometimes justification can lead you to have a false belief, but most of the time justification leads us to the truth, which is why we seek it in the first place. But um, obviously, it's not 100% accurate in every case. Sometimes evidence can mislead. Like, take the case of a child who 
hears all kinds of stories that Santa Claus exists and they go to the mall and they see someone dressed as Santa and they, you know, they come to believe with all that evidence that Santa's real, even though there is no such thing. You can imagine an individual case of justified belief towards that proposition. Anyway, usually the evidence leads us to the correct conclusions. Sometimes, though, we can be deceived or misinterpret the evidence, too. Okay, so that's what knowledge is. Now, next I want to talk to you guys about what are two big positions on where most human knowledge comes from. Um, in the literature on the theory of knowledge throughout the centuries, there have been these two rival positions on where most of our human knowledge comes from. So let me talk about that. <clears throat> So two different positions on human knowledge. One of them is called empiricism. And that is contrasted against rationalism. Okay. Empiricism versus rationalism. So first of all, empiricism. Um, this is the idea that most human knowledge comes from... Uh, the five senses and observation. So this says that most knowledge comes from the things that we can observe with the five senses. That's the position. Most human knowledge comes from hmm, the five senses and observation. Okay, so the five senses, what are those? There's, um, there's sight, taste, touch, hearing, and smell, five senses. And those five senses give us most of our immediate information about what is going on in our local environment. Right now, um, I guess, you know, you know, for example, that I'm wearing a black uh, Lacoste shirt because you can see it with your eyes through the view that you have of me through the camera. Um, and... Like if you hear a fire truck uh, driving past, then you have knowledge based on your sensory perception using your auditory sense, your hear hearing in your ears, that there's some type of emergency in your local neighborhood or, or whatever, maybe a fire. Um, sometimes it's sight, sometimes it's hearing, sometimes it's smell. You're walking around and you can smell barbecue, and so you know that someone is cooking a barbecue, and you've been notified of that through your ability to perceive through what they call the olfactory sense of the nose. There's taste, um, like you can know that food has gone spoiled if you can taste that it tastes rotten. Um, you can know that there's too much salt in the dish if it tastes that way. Um, and then there's, of course, tactile perception, like what you can feel with your uh, limbs and appendages. Um, right now, I can know that I'm seated on this chair because I can actually feel the seat and my weight um, pressed against it underneath. Um, sometimes, like in the car, you're focused on the road and you want to grab your phone over here to your right and you don't have the ability to look, but you feel around and as you feel the distinctive texture and contour of its shape, your hand is telling you, okay, using tactile sensation, I can sense that this is my phone right here. Okay, so anyway, the five senses of sight, taste, touch, hearing, and smell, they inform us about all kinds of things in our environment and in our surroundings. Some think that most human knowledge all comes from those things, from the five senses and observation. Not just those things that we can observe directly using the five senses, but also those things that we can observe by means of tools and instruments that we've developed to enhance our ordinary powers of perception, like a telescope gives you powers of magnification much greater than the human eye alone, a stethoscope similar with, with sound, and, and perhaps other examples can be given for the other senses as well. So empiricism as a view is the view that most of our human knowledge comes from that kind of stuff, the stuff we can see, taste, touch, hear, and smell, and, um, and observe in those ways. As an example, um, do we know that dinosaurs ever existed? Well, we think that this is knowledge that we do have. What would be the evidence of their existence? What's the reason? How do we know that? Can you tell me? It's easy enough. What's the reason that we have evidence to believe that it, dinosaurs walked the earth? <clears throat> Do 
Yes, they would be the fossils, right, Danny? The, the recovered fossilized remains in Kenya and others, same, yeah. So we know about that because we've recovered these remains and we can fossil date them, you know, using carbon dating methods. That's knowledge based on empirical data because we actually have to excavate these things, see them, measure them, and et cetera. So it's based on observable evidence. Rationalism is a different point of view though, okay? So rationalism says that most human knowledge, instead of coming from the five senses and observation, most of it comes from pure ideas and reason alone. So here we go, rationalism. Most human knowledge comes from reason and ideas. Reason, ideas, and abstract thought. Okay, so rationalism is kind of a rival point of view which contrasts with empiricism. These are two different schools of thought. According to rationalism, it's not the five senses and observation which gives us most of our human knowledge. Instead, it's just pure abstract thought applied to concepts that we can consider in the mind alone. So when you think of rationalism, think of knowledge that we have in domains and fields like geometry, um, pure mathematics, um, trigonometry, logic. So for you to know that all the points lying on the perimeter of a circle are equally distant from the radius, you don't need to get up and smell, see, feel, taste, or touch anything. You can just think in your mind of the concept of a circle, and you can deduce its geometric properties just logically sitting in an armchair and thinking about it. So rationalism doesn't assume the investigation of anything with the five senses. It instead just considers ideas in the mind and thinking about those. Um, for you to know that there is a midpoint between any two points that lie along a geometric line, the midpoint which bisects the two, you're simply operating with definitions and concepts in the mind. You don't need to actually have any kind of drawn figure or any kind of sensory input to know this. So knowing that like, I don't know, the square root of 81 is the number nine or that the decimal expansion of pi continues to infinity or um, you know, any other number of logical axioms, those would be in the realm of rationalism and rational knowledge. I guess what these guys say is that, yes, we do have the five senses, but just like the animals have them as well. And when we have knowledge that surpasses what the animals can perceive with the five senses, that's where our rational and conceptual knowledge comes in. And that's what makes us different and more impressive than the other animals. In my own mind, though, to be clear, I find that the debate between empiricism and rationalism is a little bit overdone. I think that really both of them are important sources of knowledge that work cooperatively to fully inform us of the big picture of the world around us. So sometimes we're just thinking about mathematical concepts in the abstract. You know, we're just doing logic problems, math problems, trigonometry, geometry problems. And in other cases, we're physically investigating using the five senses um, and trying to come to conclusions based on that. So in my own view, they, they're complementary, they're both important, but if you go back in history a little bit, you'll see that there are those who emphasize one or the other more. Um, British empiricists of the 19th century were fans of this. Rationalist thinkers like Rene Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz of the early modern era are more in the rationalist camp. Okay, so, so far what we've done is we just define what knowledge is, we've talked about the different criteria of it, justification, truth, belief, and we've now described and outlined you know, two main positions on human knowledge. All I expect you to know is these definitions and what they mean, and so we move on. <clears throat> okay, so now um, I kind of just want to talk to you guys a little bit about evidence and what evidence is. Since we've talked about justification, I want to kind of emphasize the notion of evidence a little more in, in more detail. So evidence is just anything that can prove or disprove a claim. <clears throat> so 
something that proves or disproves a claim. So evidence is the stuff that you would give as support for a belief. It's the stuff that serves as justification, if you have it, that backs up and um, stands up a belief that a person has. So we talked about the evidence that dinosaurs existed. In that case, it would be fossil evidence and the fossil record. That would tend to offer proof towards the claim that dinosaurs existed. Um, sometimes evidence is given to disprove a claim. Suppose that, um, I don't know, a person was accused of breaching capital on January the 6th because there seems to be um, uh, a tip given to the FBI by someone who thinks they saw them there. But suppose in this case it was mistaken identity, I don't know, and the individual trying to clear their name offers some evidence that disproves the claim that they were there. Like maybe they have video uh, footage of them taking social media posts from a completely different part of the world on that same day. Maybe they have receipts which they could provide up, which would show that they couldn't possibly have been present if they were purchasing something uh, from a vendor in another city somewhere far away. So evidence can be given in a court of law or it can be given informally between people, academics, everyday citizens to either make the case or that something is or is not true. Um, in a court of law, we don't just say, hey, vote on the person's guilt and just go with whatever you think. We say, here's a presentation of evidence in the court and you will decide whether this evidence is, evidence is sufficient to prove the question of guilt or whether it doesn't rise to that level of, of certainty. Um, now, there are different sources of evidence. Total certainty is usually not possible, so we have to get in the habit of looking for the evidence and seeing how strong it is. Um, evidence can serve as premises towards the conclusion of an argument. Okay, so premises, evidence, justification. There's just a family resemblance between all of these mentioned concepts. Now let me talk to you about what are some good reliable sources of evidence. Major basic sources of evidence that we all rely on every day to notify us and inform us about the world and what's going on. So here are some basic sources of evidence that I'll list below. Okay, so one basic source of evidence is just direct perception, direct experience. So sometimes the evidence that you have is that you yourself were present to witness whatever it is that you're claiming has happened. And in that case, the evidence is very strong because as they say, seeing is believing. You know, if you witness something yourself with your own two eyes or ears or whatever you may have working for you, then that's very, very clear and compelling evidence. But it's not the only possible source of evidence. Sometimes we know about things and the evidence we use is not our own experience, but somebody else relaying the experience that they had to us. And so that's what we call testimony. Testimony is evidence that comes to us based on what other people say or write. So um, I, I guess we talked about the knowledge that the Declaration of the, in, of the of Independence of the United States was signed in 1776 by the framers. Now, how do you know that? What's your evidence? Well, you didn't experience it because this happened centuries before you were even born. So how is it that you have evidence about it? Well, because you read about it in history books. So those are like the recorded writings and testimonies given to us from previous generations and handed on down. So reading things in books that have been reported as authoritative sources, that would be a case of testimony. Media reports would be another example. You know, suppose that um, you heard that there was a tornado in um, another part of the world, but you didn't see any of the footage. You just read about the reports online or in some other form of media. Hearing the testimony recorded in the report is your evidence that it happened in that case. So testimony sometimes is given to us as evidence. Sometimes in a court of law, testimony can serve as evidence, right? Someone just goes up there and says, I witnessed the crime being committed, and it was Jones, this person who's been accused. So you hear the witness give testimony. Now that's evidence. You are not present. Perhaps there's no footage or anything else that has survived, so you can't experience it, but someone else has, and they're providing testimony to you. In such cases, you sometimes have to judge the credibility of the source of testimony, whether that's an individual, a media organization, a political party, or anything else. But oftentimes, competent testimony can be and is considered a reliable source of evidence. And we have to rely on testimony because we can't just be there for everything that's happening, right? You're not going to, you don't have the ability to be the person walking on the moon, but you can read about it happening in the media. Um, 
So testimony is huge. If we didn't have testimony, if we didn't have language to inform us about other people's experiences and knowledge, then we would be pretty much walled off into our own set of personal experiences with no ability to compare facts or compare experiences. Okay, direct experience and testimony, two main sources of knowledge or evidence, I should say. Um, there's also memory and inference. Sorry, let me get that spelled here below. Inference. So memory is what preserves previously perceived events in your mind. Like, so for example, um, do you know what you had for dinner last night? I bet you, you do. But how do you know that? Well, because the experience is over. So it's not like you're still eating it and that's how you know, like I'm just looking at it because that was last night. Testimony, well, that would be a bit awkward if someone called you and said, hey, last night you had like mashed potatoes because first of all, probably no one else was aware of what you had or if they were aware, they would assume that you remembered on your own. So wouldn't be testimony as evidence usually unless you forgot and you're like amnesiac and people have to constantly remind you of the things you were doing before like the movie Memento. But all joking aside, what you had for dinner last night, the evidence that you had, it isn't based on the current experience anymore, nor testimony, it's memory. It's because you can go back in the mind's eye and recall the events of last night, you know? And so that's just one random example, but it generalizes. Tell me what you were doing on your last birthday. I think you know what you were doing and what's your evidence? Well, it's the preservation of the memories of the events recorded in your mind. So when we're no longer on the scene, and when we're not in position to receive testimony from another source, sometimes it's our own memory which serves as the evidence of what is happening. But just as with testimony, and there's some room to sometimes have skepticism about its accuracy, our own memories are sometimes capable of being false as well. We'll talk about that in a moment. For the most part, we have to rely on them, and we do. But memories are not perfect. They're not photographic in most cases. I know we've heard a few cases of people that seem to have very precise and almost photographic type memory. But for most of us, there's always room for error, especially when events are complicated, happening fast, and when we're not prepared mentally to set things down and commit them to memory. So memory is huge, and we do rely on it, but it's not always 100% perfect. And then we've got inference. Okay, so inference is evidence where you draw a conclusion from some other related set of facts. Take the case again of the, uh, the fire truck that you hear in your neighborhood. You might take that as evidence that there's a fire going on. Now, how do you infer that there is a fire from the sound of the fire truck? It's not by seeing a fire. It's not by hearing someone tell you there's a fire going on. And of course, if it's happening live, it's not yet in the possession of memory. But you might draw a conclusion from that and then infer from the evidence that you do have. Another example, there was a murder committed and um, let's say a weapon was recovered from the crime scene um, and a footprint was found there which has a shoe that one of the suspects is known to own. Okay, so looking at the footprint and then comparing it to their shoe print, you see that it kind of matches. You might infer based on that that this is the killer, and that's an inference based on the matching print with the example of the shoe that they currently own. Now, in that case, it's not that you were there to, to witness the murder, and you're not hearing witness testimony from someone that was. And, of course, since neither of those is present, then there's no ability to have a memory of it. But you might have inference. You know, you're inferring this conclusion from some other data that leads to that in conclusion. So we use all four of these basic sources of evidence every day all the time, oftentimes without even consciously thinking about it. And many times we will have corroboration from multiple sources of evidence. The best type of justification you can get is when all the different sources of evidence align and reinforce one another. So what you saw is the same thing other people say. It's what everyone seems to remember, and it's what the other available evidence implies. But where it's tricky sometimes in life is when the sources of evidence that you have contradict each other. That's when you have to make tough choices about which source to prioritize over the others. Suppose that you have, for example, two different sources of testimony claiming the opposite thing. You get a text message from one friend and they say to you, um, suppose, right, that we're not in the pandemic. So suppose the person says, hey, don't come to school today um, they're evacuating the school because there's been a fire on, on, on the campus, so they don't want us there. So today, I guess you get a free pass. You don't have to come to class. You're reading this text. You're like, awesome, no school today. My friend just told me that. But then you get another text from a different friend, and they say this. 
hey, have you heard all these rumors about the school fire, LOL? There's no such thing. I don't know why people are saying that, but we all have to still go to school today. Someone claimed there was a fire, but there really wasn't. So now you have two different friends that are offering opposite testimony. One says there's a fire, so school's out. The other person says, no, that's not true, and I've got the real information. Now you're going to have to be the individual to judge between those two, or you might have to seek for further tie-breaking sources of evidence that can corroborate one or the other. You know, so you might have to seek additional testimony, or you might have to go and look at media reports um, that give you the ability to like view the scenes in some kind of footage or video. Um, so I'm just telling you, sometimes, you know, in the best of scenarios, all the evidence aligns, and you don't have any tough judgments to make. But in other cases, you do have to be a little critical and make a relative determination about which is the more reliable source when the two don't align. Now, obviously, if someone gives you testimony and it conflicts with what you yourself remember or what you yourself are seeing, then it's easy to, to rule out the testimony and go with the stronger evidence. Like if you're on the campus and you're just watching the fire and you're smelling the smoke and you're seeing the flames and you get a text from someone that's like, you know, I heard there was a fire, but you know what? It's not happening. You can notify that person and you're incorrect. I think you've been misinformed because I'm actually here and I can see it. So normally you're going to trust what you see over what other people say if what they say contradicts what you're perceiving. But even there, there's possible room for error. I mean, sometimes people are schizophrenic or on drugs and their perception is out of line with the facts. And in that case, you might know that and weigh that in the balance of factors as you judge the credibility of the evidence. Okay. So anyway, um, Try your best to accumulate the best, most widespread and thoroughly corroborated evidence as you form your opinions and beliefs in the world. Um, we're learning about knowledge, and evidence is one of the key criteria of knowledge. The next thing, though, in the textbook are an uh, interesting description of different types of common errors that we can make and what are some unreliable sources of evidence, too. So... Sometimes our memory can fail us. I think I mentioned that just now as we spoke about memory. The textbook gives a little bit more of a thorough discussion of that, and they talk about false memory. So false memory is a phenomenon that happens when a person thinks they have an accurate memory, but it's not. It's a, it's a case where you think you can remember something, but the event that you think you have a memory of either did not happen or it didn't happen the way you think it did in your memory. So this is when one thinks they have a memory. Of an event that did not happen. So because false memory is a possible thing, because it can happen and it's real, we also have to get in the habit of not just automatically assuming that every single thing that we appear to have a memory of is really correct to the facts. We have to be able to check ourselves against the liability and the possibility of error, at least occasionally. So, um, yeah, sometimes our memories can be shaped by the chaos of the situation that we're observing. And sometimes they can also be shaped by leading questions that people ask us about those so-called events. Um, for example, in a, in a survey given to, to a group of people about what they remembered concerning uh, how fast two cars collided with each other, so they were all shown the same footage. But simply by changing the wording of the questionnaire, their memories started to diverge. So two cars hit each other, and one question on the on the survey was how fast were cars going when they smashed each other? This led to an average reported speed of 42 miles per hour. Another question, how fast were the cars going when they collided with each other? Because the verb collided sounds less forceful than smashed. This reduces the average reported mileage to 40 miles per hour. How fast were the cars going when they bumped into each other? Another survey question asks another group and their average reported mileage was 38 miles per hour. How fast were they going when they hit 35 miles per hour average. How fast were they going when they made contact with each other? This brings the average reported mileage down to 32 miles per hour. So a full 25% difference in the reported mileage, just depending on how the question was asked. So sometimes how questions are framed and how information is framed for us can establish within us an incorrect or misleading set of memories about those events. Um, even more disturbing is sometimes wholly confabulated set of facts. 
there was this case, and I can't remember all the details right now. Maybe I should research it, or one of us will look it up for the next class. But there was like a famous case of a uh, little elementary school, I think like a kindergarten, where a rumor had developed, I think, in association with one of the parents of the child, that there had been some inappropriate touching by some of the teachers and staff of the children there. So this got reported to the law enforcement as a complaint, and they were pursuing and investigating this complaint. In conducting interviews with some of the young children, questions were asked, like, show us on this doll where so-and-so touched you, and how did that make you feel? And, you know, these leading questions actually established in the minds of some of these young, impressionable children false memories of abuse that did not happen. Later on, it was thoroughly investigated in a more forensic way, and it was discovered that none of this was true. But merely the way the questions were asked and rumors on the schoolyard led to a huge controversy, which actually destroyed many people's professional careers and lives. So not to say that we should have an innate sense of skepticism about survivor stories and so on, because it's very important that we do grant initial credibility. But we still have to vet and verify such claims because memories can, after all, sometimes have erroneous or confabulated details. Um, another interesting kind of pop culture example of such a thing as false memory is the somewhat mm, discussed uh, Mandela effect. Has anyone ever heard of that? Internet people out here, have you ever heard of the so-called Mandela effect? If you do, let me know. If you've heard of it, then you can let the rest of us know maybe what it's about, kind of. But anyway, I'll tell you while those are thinking about it. The Mandela effect is just a, a term that is used for false memories that uh, establish themselves collectively in the minds of many people. So it's kind of like a collective misremembering of some event or phenomenon in the world. Um, one example of it is the old film Star Wars. Okay, so there's a classic piece of dialogue from Star Wars that almost everybody seems to have a false memory of. If you know about what I'm talking about, there's a scene towards the end where Luke Skywalker is battling Darth Vader. And Darth Vader has this iconic line where he says, such and such, I am your father. Now, do you remember what the omitted part of that line is? Um, what does he say? Blank, I am your father. Does this resonate with you? I don't know if it does or doesn't, but basically here's the situation. Most everybody seems to remember this line, Luke, I am your father. But if you go back to the original audio and film and script, you'll see that in fact, that's not ever uttered. The statement is, no, I am your father. So you know, people look at that and it, it dawns on us that we can sometimes not just individually misremember details, but even collectively so. I mean, the Mandela effect, sometimes people take it too far off the rails, you know, like, oh, well, we're living in a branching universe where, you know, it used to be that way and now it's different. So reality is like switching or something. But the most, you know, uh, legitimate explanation for such a phenomenon is just that at some point in our, the history of our society and culture, the misremembered line uh, achieved prominence, and then it kind of just got stuck in our collective memory until it was pointed out to us that that's not actually the right line. Um, there's others like that, a lot of them from film. There's the Berenstain Bears, which everyone seems to remember as the Bernstein Bears, old 80s children's books from, from uh, Field of Dreams, Kevin Costner film. Uh, if you build it, they will come. That's what everyone seems to remember, it's a famous line, but actually they say if you build it, he will come. Forrest Gump, Mama always said that life is like a box of chocolates. That's what everyone remembers. But the actual uh, line from the film is, um, Mama said that um, life was like a box of chocolates in the past tense. These are small little dialogue changes in the way people remember them. But again, they just highlight the larger point that sometimes our memories are not 100% accurate, like just a photograph. And therefore, we have to sometimes be willing to further investigate the facts, even when we think we have clear memories of certain events. Um, okay, so we've made a good you know, inroads into chapter uh, four, and we'll be able, I think, to finish it all off next time when we return. So I guess that's the plan for now. We're gonna finish chapter four on Wednesday, then next week, Monday, we'll have our review session, and then the midterm exam is next Wednesday. So as I said at the beginning of today's meeting, I have graded the quiz and the first homework. Anybody who wants their grade for that, just please do send me an email, and I'll be sure to get back to you before 48 hours from the time you send me your message. Um, I haven't been able to go through a lot of them today because I've just been teaching wall-to-wall -wall since 9 a.m., 
But if I don't get to them tonight, I'll certainly be up early in the morning and I'll be going through my inbox then. So you're invited anytime to get in touch with me for those grades. Um, okay, guys, so let me know that we're good to go. And if so, I'll let you all head out for today's meeting and we'll resume back on Wednesday. So just let me see in the chat before I sign off. Everything's fine, we're all right. <clears throat> okay, perfect, appreciate you guys, thanks again. And yes, I'll be in touch, so have a great day and until Wednesday, take, take care, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. <clears throat>